All right, if you are there, I'm going to ask you to stand with me in Luke chapter 16, and let's read the first three, 13 verses as a responsive reading, if you would. <clears throat> I'll begin in verse 1, read the first um, uh, verse in odd-numbered verses, and if you will read the uh, even-numbered verses beginning in verse 2, we'll stop at 13. And it goes like this, And he, that is the Lord, said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg, I am ashamed. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. <laughs> if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings, please. Father, thank you so much for being the God that you are and being so gracious to us. We're so grateful for all that you provide to us, for life, for an earth on which to live it, for the air that we breathe and the sunshine that we see on day like this, for health, for friends, for freedom, for all the things you give us each and every day that we so much take for granted. <clears throat> Father, for the things you keep away from us as well, the tragedies, the catastrophes, the natural disasters, the bad health, the, the accidents, all the things that don't happen to us that we also take for granted. Father, help us to realize how blessed we are. And Father, as we look into your word today, may your Holy Spirit take it and apply it to our hearts, to our lives, to our situations. May we consider it <clears throat> carefully, and may we respond to it in a way that honors you, glorifies you, in a way that's also best for us. May our responses to this message today be in accordance with your will, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and please be seated. We're continuing our series called Finding Significance in Life. We're on week four of five weeks. We'll finish it next week with the rest of this chapter. But today we're talking about uh, kind of an unusual topic. As you can see the title, Who's Your Daddy? Now, uh, <clears throat> how many of you have ever watched, well, I don't know if you want to admit to this, how many of you have ever watched the Mari Povich show? Okay. I, I've seen it. I've seen it a few times, and you know, it's, it's got one theme to it, right? It didn't used to be that way. It was kind of a talk show. We talked about different things and different, different stuff, but then he hit on this idea of, of having uh, a, a couple on there, or they were disputing paternity over the child, and he started doing DNA tests. And then he would, uh, they would, he would let them argue and almost break out into fisticuffs on the, on the show. And then at the end, you know, at, at, at the segment, he would open this big envelope dramatically and pull out a sheet of paper and then pause, maybe go to commercial and say, well, read it after we come back. And then, you know how it works, right? And then he would, uh, 
read the results of the DNA, DNA test. It says, you are the father. He would say, you are the daddy. Well, that's kind of what I'm talking about today, but I'm talking about it in a different way. <clears throat> and this, this uh, way of looking at it is a little less pleasant to me <clears throat> because I'm a baseball fan and I'm a Yankees fan, and you know that. And a few years ago, uh, maybe more than a few years ago, the Yankees and the Red Sox were battling it out as they have a tendency to do for the, uh, the championship of the American League East. And um, uh, one of the pitchers for the Red Sox was really, really good and uh, was beating the Yankees. And he, finally, he finally said after he was beating them regularly, he just got inducted into the Hall of Fame too a couple years ago, uh, but he said, uh, who's your daddy? Talking to the Yankees. And what he was insinuating was, I own you. I, I control you. I'm the one who, who determines the outcome of your season. And he was right. He was a really good pitcher. It was hard for us to, to, to beat him. That's what I'm talking about here. Who's your daddy? Who controls you? Who are you serving? Keep that in mind as we go through this parable, which is one of the most difficult, in fact, most commentators say it is the most difficult parable to understand of all the ones that the Lord talked about, the parable of the unjust steward that we just read together. And that's your first blank, the unjust steward, verses 1 through 8. You know, it's interesting that the Lord will use this example to teach spiritual principles. He's talking about a corrupt steward. A steward is, is like a manager uh, of, of your goods, your assets, your, in this case, his finances. Uh, he was in control of accounts receivable for his master. That is, uh, other people owed his master money, uh, or in some cases, oil or wheat or other tangible goods like that. And so he was in charge of all those things. But word got back to his master that his steward was ripping him off. He was embezzling from his master. He was not doing a good job. And so his master says, come on in. We need to talk. You need to give an account of all your, your, your handling of my affairs, and then you're going to get fired. He says, thou mayest no longer be steward. So this steward says, oh, man, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I've been doing this a long time. I can't go out and dig ditches now. That's why he said, I cannot dig. He says, I don't, I don't want to go out and get a day laborer's job. That's physical work. I, don't, I can't do that after so many years of not doing that physical work. I, I, and and I'm, I'm ashamed to beg. I don't want to hold a little cardboard sign in the street corner and ask for donations for all the chariots passing by. He says, I've got to figure out what to do. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare for the future and I'm going to put myself in a position where somebody out there will hire me. I'm going to put myself in the good graces of those who owe my master money or oil or wheat or whatever they owed my master. And I'm going to give them such good deals, they're going to like me and then they're going to hire me when they find out I don't have a job anymore. And this is the interesting part to me. He starts calling the creditors in one by one. He says in verse 5, So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? Now do you see something odd about that? Why is he asking them how much they owed? Now he's, here's the interesting, well of course we know he's not doing a very good job of taking care of the affairs, right? So he probably doesn't know. That's possible. He's not keeping good books. But what's interesting to me, this guy is crooked as a dog's hind leg, right? He's corrupt. He's stealing. He's embezzling from his master. He's a thief. You can't trust him. That's why he's getting fired. But what he's doing is he's bringing the creditors in by one and asking them how much they owe. He's depending on their honesty. He who doesn't have any is expecting them to give him an honest answer. And they think they do. Now each one of them could have just made up a figure. But they didn't. They would come in, the first one, verse 5 there, and verse 6 says, I owe him a hundred measures of oil. He said, sit down quickly now before somebody walks in the office here and mark that, change that to 50 instead of 100. 
The second guy owed 80 or, or 100 measures of wheat. And he said, change it to 80 for score. So he's depending on their honesty to tell him what they owed. And he said, just cut that down, cut that down, cut that down. And maybe the one he wanted to work for, he gave the bigger discount to. I don't know how that worked. But he is putting himself in their good graces. Now, you say, your first thought might be, why in the world is the Lord using this as an example to teach people? Because the, this, this guy's boss, before he fired him, commended him for his worldly wisdom. And it sounds like the Lord is condoning embezzlement. That he's condoning dishonesty. But he's not. He's not. He's doing what any good preacher would do. He's finding an illustration everywhere he possibly can. Right? Now, uh, preachers do this. I don't know if you know that or not. But whatever we see in life, whatever we're reading, whatever we're doing, I spend most of my time looking for uh, illustrations and stories and applications of things. <clears throat> if I'm in your wood shop and you whack your thumb with a hammer, my first response is going to be, that's a good illustration. <laughs> the second one would be, oh, I'm so sorry. Can I get you a Band-Aid? But we're always looking for illustrations. And so the Lord sees this. He he's, tells a story, and the way he tells it indicates to me that it, it was a true story, that it really happened. These were real individuals he was talking about. But he's using this as an illustration to teach spiritual truths. We see this in other places throughout Scripture. The Apostle Paul, for example, used war. War is not a good thing, is it? War is not a good thing for us to get involved in. War is where you see a lot of things broken and a lot of people killed. That's not a good thing. Never is a good thing. But Paul used war as an illustration for spiritual battles, spiritual warfare. <clears throat> wasn't condoning war, he was using it as an illustration. Slavery is also mentioned in Scripture numerous times. Paul talks about slavery. Slavery is not condoned in Scripture, but it's used as an illustration of our service for the Lord. And here, the Lord is using this story about embezzlement, thievery, and dishonesty to teach spiritual principles. That's what we're getting into here. But what, what, the, what the Lord, this man's Lord, not the Lord, not our Lord, what, but this man's boss, let's put it that way, his master, <coughs> commended him in verse 8. Because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. What he's talking about here is the fact that this man did several things, and here's where you get to your next section on your handout, several good points about this most difficult parable. Number one, blank under there, is this steward knew that he would be called to account. His master told him that. He gave him forewarning. Now, he didn't have to do that, by the way. He could have just said, hey, come on in the office here. He didn't. He said, I want you to come give an account. He said, get your stuff together. Get the books ready. Bring all the receipts in. Everything you need for this accounting, for this audit. I don't know if you've ever been audited by the IRS. I haven't. But if you get audited by the IRS, they're going to send you a notice and give you plenty of advance warning that you're going to be audited. And they tell you to bring your stuff. Bring every possible receipt. Bring all your books, all your records, all your statements, bank statements, everything you can possibly get. Bring it with you. You're going to need it. That's what this guy said to his servant. Said, you're about to be audited. You're about to give an account. Bring everything with you. So this steward knew that he had to be called into account. And he took it seriously. He took it seriously. That's the first application we need to make. The first thing we need to remember is that every one of us, and this is actually a quote from Romans chapter 14, verse 12, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every single one of us. This man understood this. Unfortunately, many Christians don't realize this. This guy's in the living in the material world. He's going to give an account of material things. And what the Lord is saying, he said, verse 
8 again, he says, For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. What he's saying is he's making a comparison. He's saying the people of this world, <coughs> he's talking about unsaved people. He's talking about people with a materialistic mindset. He said that many of them are in their generation, in this world, wiser than the children of light, the spiritual children of God, the saved people. It says these people in this world, they know that they're going to have to give an account of themselves. We see that all the time. We, we see that when, when in, in business, if you've ever been in business, you have to give an account to your supervisor, has to give an account to their manager, has to give an account to the president or whoever is up in, in, in the company. There's always a hierarchy in businesses. And the bigger the business, the bigger the hierarchy. Everybody has to account to somebody else. And the view is always on the bottom line in a company. Well, that's the way they do things. That's just normal. We expect that. But we have to realize that as spiritual children of God, we also have to give an account to Him. Not just for the material things that He gives us, but for the spiritual things that He gives us as well. And we need to be ready. We need to have our affairs in order, spiritually speaking. Because when, he, when we stand before God, we're going to have to give an account for everything we did with what He entrusted to us. When I worked in print shops for, for, for many, many years, I had to give an account for the things that we had. In fact, the, all, the, all the, the equipment that we had, everyone had an inventory tag on it. Some of you in companies, you've seen these little metal tags. Each one's got a number on it. And, and uh, the office knows exactly what equipment you have and what the valuation of it is and what the depreciation of it is. You keep track of all that stuff. And if you get rid of any equipment, you have to turn that tag in. They, they need to, to know uh, what equipment you're, you're getting rid of or what new equipment you're buying. And they, they keep track of all that. You have to give an account of all of it. Uh, everything that you buy, well, I couldn't buy anything unless I first, first filled out a requisition form, turned it into the office, and I had to wait for it to get approval. When it came down, was signed, and I got a purchase order, then I could go and buy what I had. But I had to, had to give, uh, tell them what I wanted to buy and why I needed to buy it for the company. There was an accounting of all those things. Well, folks, it's interesting that we know that, we accept that when it comes to material things in this world, but why do we not get it that we have to give an account to God for everything else in eternity? It's the same thing. So that's the point he's trying to make here. This steward knew he would be called to account. The second thing, here's your second, next blank. <coughs> the steward used his current position to prepare for the next one. He knew he was about to get fired. He understood that. He even accepted that. He wasn't happy about it. Nobody likes change. But what he didn't really like, he didn't want to change and have to go from being uh, a steward of his master's affairs to going to become a ditch digger or a beggar somewhere. He knew what he didn't want to do in the next job. He wanted a good job. And so he's trying to weasel his way into a good job to try and get a good position with somebody. He's using his current position. Of course, he's using it in a corrupt way. But he's using his current position to prepare for the next position. And what the Lord is saying, he's using this as an illustration for us spiritually as believers. Where are you now? Right now you're living in this body, in this world. You have whatever you have, what material things that you have, whatever money, whatever possessions, whatever position that you have. You and I need to use our current position to prepare for the next one. And not just continue on and on and on and on thinking that everything is going to be just the way it is now. There's going to come a time when we're going to, I won't use the term fire, let me say terminated. Okay? Word terminated means the same thing as fired, right? But you and I will come to a termination of this life. We know that, right? He knew it. He knew he was about to get fired from his position. He knew it was all coming to an end, but he's saying, what am I going to do now to prepare for the next position? Our next position is not going to be on this earth. It's not going to be in this body. It's going to be with the Lord. We can use our current position to prepare for the next position, right? That's the point he's trying to make here. 
<clears throat> we have some time. We don't know how much time we have. None of us knows when that's going to happen. But we need to use our current position to prepare for the next one. Your next blank. The unjust steward. And read unsaved. The unsaved steward. He's, he's materialistic. He's, he's a worldly wise guy. There's no spirituality about him in this parable at all. But the unjust steward is wiser in this, and here's your blank, material world than many Christians are in the spiritual world. He's wiser in this material world than many Christians are in the spiritual world. I've kind of covered this already in, in, in talking about this, but that's what he's trying to get across here. This guy is, is concerned about his physical future. We need to be concerned about our spiritual future. We need to prepare for our accounting to the Lord. <clears throat> you know, many business people in this world are very wise about building their businesses to make them last long after they are gone. There are also many businesses, who, small business owners who, who build businesses and, and don't think in terms of passing it on to the next generation or future generations, or uh, even if their kids or grandkids don't want their business to pass it on to other people who will want to keep the business going. Uh, th those would be uh, companies with boards and chairmen and, and hierarchies in them. But, but many of the biggest companies, the best companies that you know, have been around for generations uh, like DuPont, which was founded over 200 years ago, 1802. The guy who started DuPont, DuPont had in mind not just keeping it going as a, as a way to, for him to make a living until he died or until he retired and then just sell it or let it go defunct. He wanted to keep it going for generations after he was gone. So it's now 217 years old. Colgate was invented in 19, or Ace founded, I should say, 1806, and is still going. Cigna Insurance was founded in 1792 by people who wanted to keep it going. Those are old companies. But those are all relatively recent because they're American companies. And America is only a couple hundred, a little more than a couple hundred years old. You know what the oldest company in the world is? It's a, it's a company called Kongo Gumi. It's a Japanese company founded in 578. 578 AD. Still going today. They have one business and one business only. They build Buddhist temples. They've been doing that for over 50, almost 1,500 years. Now, that's a company that, that has a future in mind. They plan for the future to keep it going and going and going and going. That's what I call worldly wisdom. How well are we doing in preparing spiritually for beyond our own lifetime? Are we demonstrating the wisdom that these people have, have de demonstrated? And they're talking about worldly wisdom. They're talking about material things. They're talking about in this world. And they're not going to be around in a, in a generation to run these companies, but they're passing it on. They're, they're planning for the future. But you know, in this, in this um, parable, he goes on to say in verse 9, And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. What does mammon mean? Well, mammon is from the Aramaic word mammon, which originally meant that in which one puts one's trust. That in which one puts one's trust, hence wealth. What do you put your trust in? Some of these companies put their trust in wealth. And as I mentioned a little while ago, the bottom line is the bottom line. And the bottom line needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It takes care of more and more employees, and it goes on for more and more generations. It makes more money for stockholders. It benefits everybody. And that's the way they're thinking, even when they found the company, that they know they won't be around to see in 50 years. That's the planning that they have in mind. <clears throat> so let's go on to point number two. The application. I know I've been making some applications all along, but let's, let's talk about this some more. At the application. The application is, 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 that the Lord says in verse 10 is this. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is uh, unjust in the least is unjust also in much. He that is faithful in that which is least. What's he talking about there? What is least? 
Well, in context, what, what we're talking about, what he's talking about is money or material things. He that is faithful in that which is least, the Lord considers money and material things the least of all things. Now, why would he do that? Would it be because money doesn't mean anything to him? Or that he's got it all? He has all the money. He has all the material things. He's got the cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns the hills. And he owns the gold in the hills. Right? He owns it all. So God doesn't need anything materially. And you say, well, of course he doesn't. God's spiritual. God's in heaven. God doesn't need anything materially. Money wouldn't mean anything to him. But you know what? God gave us money so that we could buy things that we need to live. <clears throat> it's not money that we love or shouldn't be. It's what money buys that we want, right? You need food. It takes money to get that. You need clothing. It takes money to get that. You need shelter. It takes money to get that. But you know what? Spiritually speaking, we need to be more like the Lord, right? If the Lord doesn't care about money, then that's what we need to be more like too, right? You're saying, wait a minute. You're saying we don't need money. We just need to give it all away or get rid of it or give it to somebody and, and just, just be poor, dirt poor, and, and just be an itinerant like the Lord, just, just wander from place to place, not knowing where our next meal is going to come from, where we're going to sleep that night. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is you can have all the money in the world, but you shouldn't let the money have you. That's what we're talking about. You know, I was reading quotes from, from uh, rich people, millionaires, uh, in preparation for this. And there were so many, I couldn't, I couldn't write them all down, couldn't remember them. I wasn't going to begin to quote them all to you. But one after the other, all these millionaires, multimillionaires, billionaires, like John D. Rockefeller, talked about, who was a, a Christian, by the way, talked about how unimportant money was. After they got it, it wasn't important to them anymore. They talked about how, how wealth is measured not by how much you have, but how little you want. That's what made the difference. One after the other talked about in their, in their dying days, when they were sick and, and getting ready to die, looking around at all their wealth, the possessions. Some of them ordered their servants to bring all their possessions and, and put them in front of them so they could look at them again before they died. And when they looked it all over, they, they thought not only of all the things that they owned, but how much and how hard and how long they worked to obtain those things. They said, you know, it's all a waste. It's all a waste because I can't take it with me. It's all going to go to other people. And what do I have left? What do I have to take with me? And where am I going? That was the question also. A repeated question from numerous folks. When they came to the end of their life and they realized that all they had worked for didn't mean a thing. They had prepared wisely for this generation, but they not, had not prepared for the next world. So what is least is money in particular, material things in general. <clears throat> well, that is what money buys. So what would be much? He says, uh, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Well, the much would be spiritual things. What he's saying is if you're, if you're faithful in the little stuff that doesn't mean anything, you will be trusted. God will trust you with things that are spiritual, that, are, that do mean something, do, that do have eternal value. <clears throat> Someone has said, you can have both God and money. And I think this is blank is on your form as well. You can have both God and money, but you can't serve both God and money. That's what he means when he can't serve God and mammon. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. doesn't matter how much money you have. You can't serve God and money. You know, back in 1990, there was a rash of robberies out on the West Coast. People were stealing Rolex watches. It was kind of a fad. If you were wearing a Rolex watch, you, your life was in danger. Uh, people would just stop you and, and rob you on the street. And in 1990, a businessman 
uh, in Los Angeles staggered to the steps of his office. He had a gunshot wound in his chest. Just before he died, he called out the names of his three children. Gripped in his hand was a $10,000 Rolex watch that he'd refused to give to the robber. Instead, he got shot in the chest. He ended up being a sacrifice to his own God. A school teacher explained uh, something. Uh, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble with this probably, but she said, uh, I'm going to quote her words. She said, men just don't understand that shopping is our drug of choice. Walking through the door of South Coast Plaza is like walking through the gates of heaven. God made car trunks for women to hide shopping bags in. <laughs> That's serving mammon, isn't it? That's what we're talking about. And when Jesus says you cannot serve two masters, he has the slave-master relationship in hand. He's talking about slavery in his day, which was very common. And he's not making a comment on whether it's right or wrong. That's not his point. It's an illustration. He's saying you can't serve two masters. No slave can belong to two masters. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, just a week or two, uh, I don't know if you noticed in the no news or understood who was, uh, was talking about, but Lee Iacocca died. I don't know if you noticed that. I don't know if you re remember the name. But back in the 80s, Lee Iacocca was a big name, 70s and 80s. <clears throat> he, uh, he had a biography, it was a real popular biography about that thick called Iacocca. And he had talked about how he rose up through the ranks in the car industry in Detroit to become president of the Ford Motor Company. Then he got fired as president of Ford, and he went over to Chrysler. Chrysler was in bad shape at the time. They made terrible cars, and they were going bankrupt. And so he went and took it over, and they started uh, uh, changing the kind of cars that they made, better quality cars. I think he invented the K car. He also invented the Mustang for Ford, but he invented the K car for, for Chrysler. And Chrysler was in bad shape financially, as I mentioned. He went to the government and negotiated a multi-billion dollar loan to get them out of debt and get them back on firm financial footing. They repaid the loan earlier than expected to the government, and Chrysler started making good cars again. Nyakoko, he worked hard, I mean, worked hard all the time to get the company where it was. But he said something in his book. The, the one thing I got out of that, that thick volume was just one little section where he talked about uh, walking out of his offices in Detroit on a Friday evening and noticing all the lights that were still on in the building, all the executives, the managers, the middle management, the executive management, even the lower management, who were still there slaving away in the offices trying to make Chrysler better. And he said, you know, I, I said I never understood that. I hired these people because they were good managers. He said, they, if they were good managers, they could manage their time well enough to go home to their families when they should. Instead of working late hours on Friday night and Saturday. Some of them were working Sunday. Some were working seven days a week. He said, I didn't tell them how, how much or how little to work. I just wanted the job done. But these guys were not good managers of their time and resources. I thought, that's an interesting thing. With all his money, with all his fame, with all his power, Iacocca still went home on Friday afternoon at quitting time to spend the weekend with his family. What he did was he understood what was really important. Jesus said it this way, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own, in your own? Well, the question is, what do we have that belongs to another man? What do you have that belongs to somebody else? I'm giving you time to think about it. The answer is, everything you have belongs to someone else. Everything. That's right. It all belongs to God. Your house belongs to God. Your cars belong to God. Your money belongs to God. Your body belongs to God. Everything that you are, everything that you ever hope to be, belongs to him. And he says, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? <clears throat> in other words, everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we hope to be, belongs to him. And we are his stewards taking care of his possessions. 
everything. You know, God trusts us with an awful lot of stuff, but a little bit at a time. You know that every one of you are millionaires? He just didn't give it to you all at one time. You know, if you work at McDonald's, 10 bucks an hour average, probably, right? Now, some of them pay less than that, but if you work there for a few years, you'll make more than that because the minimum wage is going up. If you work at McDonald's for 50 years at $10 an hour, you're a millionaire. You know that? $20,000 a year times 50 years is a million. If you start there when you're 16 and work till you're 66 or 65 or something like that and, and, and retire, you have made a million dollars in your lifetime. And that's McDonald's. Most of you are doing a little bit better than McDonald's. You're millionaires, but you didn't get it all in one big, big check. Let me ask you a question. Just think about this for just a second. If you got a million dollar check today, what would you do with it? Think about all the things you'd like to do with it. How would you spend it if you got a million bucks? Some of you'd say, well, maybe I get a new car, buy a house, get some clothes. How many of you instantly thought, I'm gonna give, give uh, some of that, a chunk of that to the church? Okay. <clears throat> That's good, right? Think of all the things you do with a million bucks. Well, you have a million bucks. You're just in, you just didn't get it all in one big check. You're getting it a little bit at a time. You're getting it weekly. You're getting it biweekly. You're getting it monthly. But over the course of your lifetime, you're going to get a million bucks. Now what are you going to do with it? Are you still going to do the same things that you were going to do a minute ago? Or is it different now that you're getting it in little chunks? That's why the Lord gives it to us a little bit at a time. <clears throat> I know I'm saying this about me too, but maybe that's why the Lord doesn't give me it all one, at one time. He doesn't trust me with it, right? <laughs> he gives it to us a little bit at a time. And that's where faith comes in. We are responsible for how we manage what God has entrusted to us. And someday we will be called to give an account for what we have done with everything that God has given us. Our lives. What have we done with our lives? Our freedom. What have we done with our freedom that we prayed about in the opening prayer? What have we done with our family that God has given to us? What have we done with the finances that God has given to us? What have we done with our, our talents and our abilities that God has given to us? What have we done with the offer of salvation that God has given to us? What have we done with our spiritual gift? If you are saved, you have been given a spiritual gift. What are you doing with that? And you know what's interesting? Just as God gives you your money, your lifetime income, a little bit at a time, same thing with your talents and abilities and spiritual gifts. They come a little bit at a time. You don't get them at the beginning when you're born. You don't get any abilities when you're born. Everything has to be done for you. You can't even feed yourself. You can't dress yourself. You can't go anywhere by yourself. You need help with that. You have to learn. You, God gives you abilities as you grow up. And spiritually, it's the same thing. When you get saved, get saved God enables you to do what he has called you to do. Those, those gifts, those abilities, those talents come a little bit at a time. God gives them to you a little bit at a time, not all at once. So you can't say, well, I can't do this. God wants, I, I think God maybe wants, wants me to teach a class, but I can't do that. I don't have that ability. God wants me to sing in the, in the praise team, but I don't have that ability. God wants me to clean a church or drive a van, but I can't do this. I can't do that. We look at the abilities that we have now, and we think, well, we can't do that. But, you know, God gives you the ability that he has entrusted the, for, for the job he has entrusted you to do, he's calling you to do. So my question is, are you serving yourself and your interests, or are you serving the Lord and his interests all day, every day? In other words, who's your master? That's right. That's the question. The question is, who's your daddy? Very good. You're right there. Who's your daddy? Who are you serving? If there was a Mari Povich in heaven, and he were to open up that big envelope, who would he say is your daddy? Is it God? Or is it mammon? 
We won't leave that to Mari. We'll leave that to you. Lord's speaking to your heart about that right now. Let's stand. And, uh, and we're going to ask you to respond to whatever the Lord's laying on your heart right now. I don't know what the Lord's speaking to you about. I never really know. All I know is the message he's given me to give you. I don't know what he intends to do with it in your life. So I don't know where you are in your relationship with the Lord. But let me ask you this question. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, let me ask two simple questions. How many of you would say, Brother Paul, <coughs> as I stand here before God right now, I can't honestly say that I am a Christian, that I'm a believer, that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I know he was buried and I know he rose again. But you know, I've never trusted him as my savior. I've never done anything with the offer of salvation. If I died right now, I don't know where I would spend eternity. Would you pray for me? And that's all I'm asking you. Do you want me to pray for you? Because this is between you and God, not between you and me. I'm not gonna come to you, I'm not gonna call on you. I'm not gonna embarrass you in any way. This is between you and God. But are you concerned enough for your soul to ask for prayer? Would you put your hand up and say, Brother Paul, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? As we pause for just a moment. I appreciate your honesty. You know, that's, you can put it back down again. You know, that's not easy to raise your hand. I understand that. I've been where you are. Most of us have been where you are. Amen. I know it's not easy to ask for prayer. But I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. And I'm going to ask you to do something even harder. When we have an invitation here in just a few minutes, when, we, when, we, when the praise team sings, I'm going to ask you to step out and come down and talk to a counselor. I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm just straight up asking you. If you're concerned enough about your soul, would you be willing to step out and talk to somebody about that this morning? And they'll be, we'll be glad to help you learn what the Bible says about how to trust Jesus as your Savior. I'm going to ask you to do that in just a moment. But I'm going to pray for you before that. But before we do that, I have one more question. If you did not raise your hand, I'm going to assume that you know the Lord is your Savior. You remember when, you remember where, you remember how you were saved. How many of you would say, Brother Paul, I know I'm saved. There's no doubt in my mind. I'm going to go to heaven someday. But I'm realizing more and more that I will have to stand before God and give an account for my life, for my finances, for my spiritual gifts, for everything that I am in my life. I'm going to have to give an account before God, and I am not ready. Would you pray for me? Hands up all over the auditorium. Wow, all over the place. Thank you for your honesty. I'm going to pray for you too. But let's do something about that as well. Father, thank you so much for what you are doing in our hearts and our lives right now. Thank you for this, this parable and for the truths that it has for us. And Father, I pray especially for these who raised their hands just a few moments ago and asked for prayer for their soul. Thank you, Father, for their concern for their soul, for their realization that they will have to give an account someday and stand before you. And they're not ready. Father, I pray that you'd help them to take the next step, that difficult step, to step out of the aisle and come down and talk to a counselor about how they can trust Jesus as their Savior, how they can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they're on their way to heaven before they leave this room today. Father, I know that's a hard thing to ask them to do, but I pray, Lord, you'd help them to do that, that difficult step that all of us, the rest of us have taken. Father, I pray that you'd help them to do that too. Father, I pray for these who raised their hands and said, I know I'm saved but I'm not ready to give an account of myself. I've got some things to do to get my books in order, to get my life in order, to, to give an account to the Lord. Father, thank you so much for the eternal concern that so many have had and demonstrated and shown by asking for prayer. May your will be done in this invitation these next few minutes, we ask in Jesus' name, for his sake and with thanksgiving, amen. You come as you say. The counselors will be on the front row.